Um, I'm Lynn. Thank you for letting me take over your first class. <laughs> A little bit of it anyway. Um, I'm the curriculum specialist here at um, the School of Interior Architecture and Design. And so you don't see me much. I'm in the background. How many of you guys know what CETA is? CETA. What is CETA? The Council for Interior Design. What do you think the A stands for? Accreditation. Accreditation. Awesome. So why is CETA important? I told you guys this. <laughs> Tell me. To make sure that we're using the right courses as possible to get us the credits. Okay, to make sure you're taking the correct courses to get you the credits they need that you need. So if, in fact, I'll repeat questions so she, he doesn't have to run unless it's necessary. <laughs> the, the, so, um, CETA is an accrediting body that ensures that what we are teaching as faculty is what the profession wants you to have when you graduate. And that's why so much effort is put on ensuring that what we are teaching in class is what you will do in the real world. Um, Archana is back here as your executive director of the school, and she has worked extensively to make sure that we're trying to meet CETA. Now, that said, CETA is not the end all. There are a lot of things that we as a school want you to know beyond CETA. I mean, CETA is great for, you know, the technical things, but there are things that are unique to this school. And in particular, what I have noticed is you folks do an amazing job of conceptual development and presentation. Your portfolio classes are outstanding. And those are things that will make your portfolio and your education unique. There's 170-some CETA accredited programs in the country, so you're one of those. And how many graduates are there a year from each one? So we want to make sure that your portfolio is outstanding. You've got a great group of faculty, and what you really have are professionals that are out there teaching. That's why you're here, right? Because they bring to you what they're doing every day really a great opportunity. So if you haven't figured it out, I bet you guessed that the BFA is accredited by CETA, right? Is that why you're here? Yes. yes. So obviously you guys are very fortunate to have a global student body. And so much of what CETA requires is also this relationship to understanding globalism, and really just how close we are. Have you done your slide yet with the solar system and the Earth? Okay. Um, so Robert's slide is going to show you just how small we are when you start looking at the entire solar system. And so we are just really so much one group. That said, why I am here today is the design process is something that is fairly universal, particularly um, in the states, but even if you practice overseas. There's a process that we go through as designers to get from, oh, we're meeting with our first client, to ha, the space is done. And how is that space completed? And how many of you have read ahead or read anything about the design process yet in your modules or had any information on that? This week you read a little bit? Great. How many phases? Do you remember big, five, big phases? I just said how many <laughs> in the process? <laughs> so there's a schematic design process. Uh-huh. Okay. So the schematic and conceptual design, those are actually one of the processes. Anybody else do any process design, design process? No? Not yet? That's okay. You guys are third semester? Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk here about the design process. And um, you're welcome to interrupt me anytime. And uh, 
kind of make it an interactive discussion. Okay, so the design process, you can think about it as an analysis and the synthesis. You know, you analyze something, you synthesize it. You analyze something, you synthesize it. It's cyclical. And even when you get all the way done with your synthesis, you're not going to be done. You're going to have to come back over here and analyze what you've done. And there's this preliminary phase. Some people call it pre-design. Some people call it the initial contract. But it's where you go out and you meet your client. Um, you want to make sure that you can work with your client. I mean, there are some clients that you just know when you walk in and meet with them, it's not going to be a good match. And you might be working with this person for two years. It's going to be two years of hell, okay? You don't want that. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, you have to turn away the job, but maybe it's a point where you have to say, this is not a good match. So I tell you that right up front. As young designers, of course, everybody wants every job that'll come in the front door. But be aware, if something doesn't feel right, and you're welcome to chime in here anytime, <laughs> Robert. Just Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> if you don't get a good feeling, just trust your gut, because it's going to be torture all the way. And they're probably going to need you to mic. There be uh, lawsuits <laughs> involved. And not yeah. that I've been through any of those, but yeah. I've heard of them, and they're they're uh, contentious, so yeah, yeah. Um, everybody's pointing fingers at each other. There's the contractor pointing at the designer, the designer pointing at the contractor, the owner does pointing fingers at both. So um, if you don't get a good feeling about a client from the beginning and you're not really sure, I really, really put thought into it. Yeah, and then you also may find that the client wants you to do something that is like so outside of your scope of understanding that you are just not comfortable taking on the job, that's the point to rely on your colleagues. Well, maybe somebody else has designed a neonatal care facility in a hospital, and you want to then engage your colleague in this project. So that doesn't mean you should never take on a project you haven't done before. You'd never take on any projects. But at some point, if you know it's beyond your expertise, that's where you collaborate with somebody. And then maybe you keep your fingers in the pot, so to speak, and you learn about designing neonatal care facilities while facilitating another designer on this project. But that's what's happening in the initial client contact. Now, you can think of this process for residential or commercial. It's the same. And I will jump between talking about residential clients and commercial all at the same time. Because a lot of this in residential is psychology. You know, are you dealing with a couple where one of them has the purse strings and the other one has all the big ideas? And in your initial client meeting, you see that friction. And you're going to get stuck caught in between those two folks, or perhaps three folks. So just be aware. That's why you take psychology classes. Go ahead. You were going to say I something. Just, I could say, I just call it hand-holding, because okay. that's really what you're doing is, you know, calming them down. It's going to be okay. And you, you've got to, you can negotiate between multiple people, like you said, Lynn. Yeah. Or you may be working with a corporate client where maybe they're um, designing a restaurant. And so the chef is involved because the chef has an idea of how she thinks it's supposed to look because she's controlling the menu. And then you have the owner, and they're thinking about how they want it to be. But then they tell you, but this is the age group that I want to attract. And you're that age, and you're like, uh-uh. That menu doesn't interest me, and certainly that design doesn't. And so you may have to sometimes educate the client. And um, Look, I know this is what you want, but you have asked me to design for your client's client. And so sometimes you have to do more research and educate the client. That's why you hired me. 
anything to add. I mean, feel free. <laughs> it's like, I love when professionals are in the room because they add so much to this. Okay. No, no nothing to add ex okay. on that. All right, Archana too. Yeah. So, that's that's like an initial phase, and frequently you don't get paid for that. Some people will charge to do an initial client contact. Sometimes you'll do a, a base fee, an hour or two of your fee, and then you just go ahead and absorb that cost when you go into the standard uh, part. All right, or the standard, uh, when you get the contract is what I'm saying. So the main phase one of the design process is called programming. And yes, there's a quiz, so I'm really glad to see you guys are taking notes. Phase one, programming. Now, programming is, all right, you've had your initial client meeting, you've got guys decided it's all gonna work out, maybe you've put together a bit of a contract, everybody's agreed to it. And in programming now, this is the phase where you're gathering information, okay? That's phase one, and we'll go into that in more detail. Then there's phase two. And this is what you were talking about, the schematic conceptual design. So here you've kind of been told everything you need to know or think you should know about the client. And here you finally get to start doing some design work making sure that you're analyzing what you've, and synthesizing what you've already analyzed, okay? You're pulling it together. That's the second major phase. The third major phase is called design development. So maybe here, you've decided that you're going to go with a certain um, open office planning idea. And then here, you might be doing some very specific requirements of furniture and fabrics and finishes and and what is the actual ceiling material going to be very specific design ideas hey uh, Lynn yeah I would I like to call schematic design it's the to me it's the really fun part of it because it's the what if part of the project what if we did this yeah. and what if we tried this and what that this is the this is the phase of the project where you get to like throw it all out on the table because nobody's judging you. You're, you're, you and your teammates are throwing ideas out on the table and seeing what sticks, what's the best solution or po best possible two or three solutions to show your client. Yeah. The design development is where you, you're narrowing that down to be, start to be real. And that's kind of the uh-oh uh phase because you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, or yeah. <laughs> The uh oh, and then once you get past the uh oh, then yes. your con contract documentation. I'll go into more on each one of these. Think of contract documentation in reverse. If you're trying to figure out what you do in that phase, you're documenting the contract. So all of these great design decisions that you've made along the way, somehow you have to document them. So they either get built or things get purchased or things are assembled in the, right, in the correct way. This can be tedious. A lot of times designers don't like that phase. <laughs> you have to have, to have to have a lot of science in there. The, the, the thing for me with that phase uh, contract, as a young designer, I didn't like it because it really, it really, you have to get into the nitty gritty details, otherwise, the project's not gonna be built how you see it or want it to be. And when somebody told me that, that's when it really stuck, is like, I'm the one guiding this thing and I want the contractor to follow what I'm uh, saying or uh, what the client has approved and what I'm saying. And if I don't show the contractor how to do that, they're not gonna do that. They're gonna cut corners. They're gonna say, well, it looks like what you drew, but yeah. It's really not what I drew, or you know. So, it, it in the beginning it'll feel tedious to have to draw page after page after page of details of things. But once you realize that, well, I think it was Frank Lloyd Wright said, "God is in the details." Yeah. It really is. <laughs> so, yeah. that the, it it takes a little bit of a mind shift to really realize this is the section where you're really spelling it out. Yep. 
and also along that same way realize that the person that's putting the paint on the wall may not even have a high school education. So you have to spell it out very clearly and succinctly because it has to be easy to follow. All right, contract administration. Again, if you can't figure out what that's about, just flip the words. You're administering the contract. All of these things you put down in writing about how things are supposed to look, now they're being done. And you're out there on the job site ensuring that they're being done the way that you drew them out to be. Um, if you think about furniture, maybe you've specified a fabric or selected a fabric to go on a particular piece of furniture. Well, maybe that happened six months ago. Maybe that fabric is no longer available. You may have to make a substitution. And that sort of thing happens in this phase. Those are the five biggies. Programming, schematic or conceptual design, design development, contract documentation, and contract administration. And by the time you leave this class, maybe not today, but by the end of this class, you should be able to spit those off, off the top of your tongue, okay? Because when you get into a job, frequently you will bill based on these. This much of the project is billed so many dollars. This is worth so many dollars to your firm. This is so many dollars. And somebody's got to keep track of all the hours that the six or seven people working on these projects are putting into this to make sure that we're not going over budget. And so when you fill out your timesheet, you may have to actually put in, oh, I was working on schematics, I was working on programming, I was working on CDs. And if you don't know what you're doing <laughs> at which phase, you can't fill out your timesheet. Okay. Just as there's a pre-design, there's a post-design. Again, typically, not, you don't get paid for this. But this is your opportunity to learn. You go back out to the site, maybe three or four months, two months, after the project is complete, and you see how things are going. Are people using what you designed the way you intended them to be? Or did you misinterpret something in your design? And you learn from that. Now, I'm not saying you're going to go back and change things, but you don't want to make that mistake again. And by the same token, if you've done something that's just like, woohoo, you know, <laughs> this is like great, you want to repeat it. Right? It's called post occupancy evaluation. Write that down. Post occupancy, occupancy after the fact, post-occupancy evaluation. And it's frequently abbreviated PO. I got to go out and do the PO. All right, I have to go do the PO. Do it. Do it to learn. Realize you're going to not get paid for it. I know you don't you never get paid for POs. But it's good to go see, ugh, that didn't work out the way I thought it was. Those people are not using that space or, oh my God, I never thought they could use it that way. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great learning curve for you as a designer to go back and see your work in use. I, I, I would throw in there, of course, post-occupancy, because you can see your mistakes that maybe you know you had to compromise to get the solution to. Um, but I would also recommend, if your company can do it and allows it, is that you go out to the site several times during the entire process of construction. Because oh, yeah. you learn by seeing what's going on, what order things are going into the building, how the contractors are working. And sometimes they have a way to achieve something you want, but in a, in a more cost-effective, time-saving way than you would even think about. Yeah. So if you can go out to the field and see things in progress, it helps a lot. And particularly in residential, if you can get a contractor that you really like to work with and that you get a partnership with, 
if you make a mistake here, that contractor is going to come to you and say, um, it says here that you have specified Sherwin-Williams paint number 458 and the color is, I don't know, green. And the contractor goes out and he mixes up a gallon of two or three or ten gallons of number 458 and guess what color it is? <laughs> Red. You missed, you missed numbered. You flipped your numbers. A good contractor that has a good relationship with you, I'll call you up. No. They don't want to have to repaint that dang wall any more than you do. And nor do they want to get into a logistical issue because you did put green beside that number. And when he opened that can, it was red, even though he had the right number or she. The same way with commercial. You know, once you start working with a, a contractor that you're comfortable with, sometimes you can convince your client, even though it might be a little bit more expensive to go with a certain contractor, that there's a relationship there that's being built and it's worth working with them. So let's look at these in a little more detail. So I talked to, first of all about the information gathering phase, programming. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through about six or seven slides here of a project that was completed for a large commercial uh, Fortune 500 company. They have asked me over the years not to use their name, okay? And it, um, I worked with um, Hughes, Litt, and Godwin, um, and uh, it was a project that they worked on. So um, this Fortune 500 company uh, wanted to move into a new space and they knew that they had to have so many people in the space. And so what you as a designer did was you analyzed this client's needs and desires. How many of you have used Excel spreadsheets? Yeah, yeah, they kind of come in really handy in this phase. If you don't have that software, it's one of those you kind of need to wrap your head around. Um, but this is an Excel spreadsheet for this company, and we interviewed different departments. So we talked to the executives, and we found out they had a president, a vice president, la di da di da how many, how many offices they needed, about how big was each office, and how much square feet was needed per office, and then some other common recommendations and requirements for their office. So this area took up Oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 18,000 square feet. Okay, so that's, that's what we're de designing, a, a place that had that. Staff, executive, and then support spaces. Now, that was all the like really technical things. Maybe also in this phase for some clients you might have had to measure an existing space or perhaps they wanted to reuse certain furniture or finishes and you had to go out and take a picture of every piece of furniture they wanted to reuse and measure it and make sure it fit. It's tedious to some extent. But you're having all of these restrictions put on your design from day one. But what's not so much a restriction is this idea of their corporate culture or their personal style. This is where you start to develop a feel for who is this client. Um, one of the projects I've worked on with students in the past is we'll design a bank. Now, United Community Bank has a whole different philosophy than say, you guys heard of Wachovia? Bank of America? Okay. So envision your United Community Bank on the corner in your little community versus Bank of America. And how that feeling and corporate culture is going to be different. And it's your responsibility to develop that in your design concept. One concept may not work for the other. And you're trying to explore and discover this in this programming phase. You're defining existing conditions, I mentioned that. If, um, if necessary and they're reusing an existing space, you've got to go out and make sure 
it, you, you measure it. You don't have perhaps drawings to work from. And I'll tell you guys, even if you get drawings, <laughs> I see you over here shaking your head. Even if you get drawings, you still have to walk through the space and make sure they're accurate. Guess whose responsibility is if it's wrong? It's not the architect that handed you the drawings. It's your responsibility to make sure what you get is accurate. And if not accurate, you make it accurate. Yep. And OK, I'm, I've made that mistake. I missed it. Uh, corner of a, I'm looking at a corner of a room here. A chase was put in, a, a fake column to hide some plumbing. Wasn't on the plan. I missed it walking through the space. And I put an L-shaped desk in that corner. Well, guess what happened when it got delivered? I have this really great desk in my office, <laughs> OK? <laughs> it's, it happens. Mistakes happen now. Actually, we used it in another place in the building, but it does happen that way. And in, in this particular case, too, we used it in another place, and I worked with the, you know, it was a, a furniture delivery service I'd used for years, and they helped me, you know, not get stuck with a $1,000 desk. So, but yeah, you're responsible. Okay, um, so another thing during this, this phase is you're developing a very broad concept statement. Um, and it goes back to this idea of corporate culture and personal style. You can't just come into a project and say, this is what I want it to be. This is my concept. No, the concept is built from your client's needs and desires and this corporate culture. So this idea of just popping in with some concept, that's you putting yourself on top of the client. And you know, we're all about designing and we want to be important, all of us do. But that's not what this is. It's about making the client important. So I've, I've always said it's not my job to give you my taste. It's my job to figure out who you are and give you the best of that. Unless it's really, really bad taste. <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> and then, or then you have to guide them along the way. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you have to. You did hire me. Now, this is important. At the end of each phase, you want to review what you found with the client and make sure they agree with it, that you've got their approval. You don't want to go on and start designing your schematics and realize that, oops, we forgot about two or three vice presidents, or they just hired three or four new people since you had this conversation. If you had 100% of your time planned for this project, this programming phase might take maybe 10% of that. And I'm going to give you some averages of it, maybe as much as 15. Okay. Now, in school, the needs and desires, the existing conditions are typically handed to you. Your faculty member has done that already. They've determined you need so many square feet, and this is how uh, the space, how many people are in the space. Because you don't really have clients you can go out and interview. But you may be, and I almost wrote on this, you may be developing your own concept based on your research about a corporate culture. Okay? But a lot of this happens with the faculty member handing you a project. Okay? Kind of with me on programming? Questions? All right, <clears throat> we'll move on. Let's look at schematic design. Schematic design, as Robert so well put it, is this really creative phase. We love it as designers. And if you love to manipulate space and play around with it, how many of you moved your furniture around in your room as a kid? Maybe, yeah, that's what you're doing. You're manipulating your environment. You are playing around with this. And you know, I, I think of it frequently as um, a puzzle. In the programming phase, 
you've been given all these little pieces, concept and executive offices, and here's the perimeter of the building. But you don't know what that puzzle's going to look like. You are designing the box cover of that. You're putting those puzzle pieces together and developing this cool interior, this cool space. And there's more than one solution. <laughs> Not that way with real puzzles, right? <laughs> yes. but, but there's more than one correct answer. And that's why faculty members try to keep studios small, because it's really hard for us as faculty to show all these different solutions. But if there's 18 of you in here, you're going to have 18 different solutions. And none of them particularly wrong, just different as long as you are meeting the client's needs and desires. So you're developing these broad-based solutions, and you have various tools that help you along the way. You may be putting together matrices. I wish this cord were longer. Matrices, or bubble stacking and blocking diagrams. Some people put matrices, by the way, in programming, so if you've seen that before, that happens too. But a matrix is basically a study of relationships. Now, in a house, it's pretty easy, right? We know we want our kitchen probably near the dining room. Okay. Where do we want the laundry room? Near the rooms. Near what rooms? Bedrooms. So I hear near the bedrooms. Anybody want to give another option? Okay, so another option might be a laundry room that's more by the kitchen or the public space. So in that situation, yeah, you'd want to make sure you ask your client or they want the laundry room, okay, kind of obvious. But in a large corporate office, you're not going to know exactly where all these different departments go. And that's part of your research in your programming was to help understand the relationships. And you can put together bubble diagrams that help you visualize how these relationships work. A stacking diagram is nothing more than if you had 100,000 square feet of space and you had 33,000 square feet on each floor. You got to decide what departments go on each floor. You're stacking them. In residential, well, we probably stack the bedrooms upstairs and the public spaces downstairs. Very simplified. But it, could, it can be very complicated. I mean, maybe you're working with a, an IBM, and there's 300 to 500 people. But where are you going to put all these people, and who has to work with whom? It's, it's complicated, but it's great because it's this puzzle you get to put together. Okay, then um, other things you do, um, you start to develop a three-dimensional image of what this is going to look like. You've seen people sketching a lot, you know, some of your older classmates or your classmates that are in upper division courses are sketching. You're sketching just general ideas of how you want this space to look based on your concept and your client's needs and desires, okay? Um, space planning, just constantly trying to plan the space. You also are going to develop some initial F, F, and E. What's F, F, and E stand for? I see one. I've heard from Somebody other than our student over here by the window. F, F, and E. Take a stab. Go ahead. I hear you. I see your mouth moving. What are you thinking? <laughs> I'm a furniture finish. Maybe? Furniture. I'll, finish I always want to say, but it's not. Furniture is right. Okay. Technically, it's furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Now... Half the designers out there are going to say furniture, finishes, and equipment, okay? But basically, you are making these very broad design decisions. And in this particular project, one of our big design decisions was which 
open office manufacturer to use. That was a big decision because that affected how we laid out the place and the space. So by off open office manufacturer? By open office manufacturer, I meant furniture that is dismountable, movable. It is not... Um, it is not like you're putting people in offices with walls. People are in more of an open office environment. And the electricity and the power and the communications is running through the base, typically, of these um, uh, pieces of furniture. And these may be people that come in for three hours a day, and then somebody else comes in here and works, or somebody else comes in and works. Or they may be standard per person. Better anything you want to add to that? <laughs> um, it's, they're usually uh, parts and pieces. And uh, um, like Lynn said earlier about bringing in somebody who knows about a hospital or, or uh, oncology unit or whatever it was. Or care or ecology, yeah. right. So typically you work with a furniture vendor, so there's Hayworth and Steelcase and a uh, whole, bu whole yeah. bunch of them. And luckily for us, we kind of walk through it with them through the showroom and kind of say, this is kind of what, and they, they are our consultant for furniture, for that type of furniture. And there's a lot of coordination that happens between you and them to get just the right placement and just the right quantity and all of that. But technically, they wind up doing most of that part. Yeah, Would it's kind of like Tinker Toys. Because yeah. each one of these panels can be a different fabric, different color. It Acoustic. could have different sound attenuation. It could be different materials. It can be glass or plastic. It can have little slots on it so you can put paper product organization in it. It can be a chalkboard. It could be a marker board. But somebody has to say what all of this is, not to mention there's all these different finishes, paint, wood, and then what type of base, and then all the different, it's, it's really a, a system. And that it's important because some of the systems are based on um, American standard imperial, six inches, nine inches, 12 inches, and the like. And steel case I think is based on 5 inches, 10 inches, 30 inches. And you think, oh, what's the difference one little inch is going to make? Well, if you've got 30 of these things lined up in a row, you've got two and a half to three feet of difference across your room, which is a corridor. <laughs> you got to have corridors. Okay, so I'm off subject. So well, that was one of our main decisions we had to make. Um, and in conversations with the client and showing them different ideas, we did go with a um, Herman Miller product. This happened to be Ethospace. Um, and then <clears throat> review and receive client approval. Now, you guys, you're also having to think about budget. We kind of left that off in programming. Somewhere in the area of programming and that initial client contact, somebody had to say, yeah, how much are we talking about spending here? And frequently it's based on cost per square foot, how much can be allowed. And so you got to make sure that this Ethospace product that you selected, is it the lower end and is all this going to be metal and plastic laminate? Or are we going to start coming in with glass and wood? You know, where, where is our price paint point? Where is our concept? Where is our style? And that all builds from that. So one of the things, and I'll show you just this one plan. That's weird. Where is that? There we go. <clears throat> so of the, you know, 1,600 <laughs> different floor plans that we worked on, this is the one we ended up presenting to the client. You see how loose it is? That is intentional. At this point, you want the client to feel like, well, I don't really know if I like that yet. You don't want to be so solid that they say, you know, I don't like this. I'm going to find another designer. Because at any point, they can stop at the end of a phase, 
stop paying you and you never get to see your project finished, which is really sad. I saw your face go down, ooh, yeah. Because <laughs> you put all your, your time and effort into this and you want to see this project go. But if you get too concrete with them too soon, they're like, uh, that's not working. And then you may lose a job. And I've been on the other end um, working at a university where the architect got too far down the line without meeting what the president of our university wanted. And we cut ties, went with another architect. So I have seen it done on that side. Fortunately, I've never been on the side where the project didn't get done. You ever been involved in anything that way where you had a client that just realizes you're headed in the... I can't uh, think of any. Yeah. I've just been on the other side of the table where we cut ties. So it happens. Um, so yeah, th this was not earth-shattering design, okay? Uh, this was a very straightforward project. They didn't have a big budget. But at the same time, what you're seeing here is that this is a window wall, sometimes called a curtain wall. And then these, of course, are the columns. And there's a, a core down the middle, a pretty straight forward building. But the idea was that all of the light around the exterior of the building could come inside. And so the only offices that you might see are towards the middle of the space. So that the majority of employees, which are in these little cubicles, if you will, I hate that word, are getting a lot of light. Kind of with me on schematic design? Anybody want to take gander at how much percentage you think this might take? How much of your time, knowing that we have five phases? Go for it. Uh, maybe 20%. Maybe 20. Yeah, that's good, a good amount. It might be 15, it might be 20. And you'll see we'll get more than 100. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> it always happens that way. Um, but yeah, maybe 15 to 20 percent of your time is spent in schematic design. But again, remember, don't go on to design development until you've got their approval. And technically, in a big firm, the big firm is going to bill the client at the end of this phase. Also, having I've worked at big firms and small firms. Uh, the big firms, and I think the small firms would benefit from it, at the end of each phase, it's not, you get the client's approval, but you get their signature yeah. so that they cannot dispute that they gave you their yeah. approval. We would have them actually sign on the project. And I don't know that I would ever feel like I had to hold a client to that, but if we ever got to a litigation, it would be good. Now, let's talk about this from a residential standpoint and a much smaller project. Let's say you're working with a residence and you're designing the master bath. Well, you probably aren't going into this much detail, okay? This phase, schematic design, may actually merge with design development. It all may become one phase and just called design. So realize that the size or the scope of the project will affect your design process to some extent. Okay, any other questions on schematic? It's warm in here, yes? Okay. Anybody need to stand up, stretch? Okay. Design development. This is where you really have to start making some very specific decisions based on that schematic design approval. <clears throat> you are going to be making decisions about how the space is going to look. And this is a final rendering, a presentation at the end of the design development phase that really shows the client what they're after. This is what you see frequently on the walls here. This is what you frequently do by the end of class, a type of design development presentation. So um, let's go on here. We've done specific design. You're really also going to be solidifying that floor plan. 
no, are, no longer is it just bunches of little boxes. You're actually going to be saying either by name or by company title who's going into each of those spaces. Um, you're going to be developing three-dimensional design solutions. <laughs> you're going to be selecting F, F, and E. Very specific. This carpet is by Shaw. It is color number blah, blah, blah. It is a broad loom carpet. It is to be laid in this direction. Very specific decisions. This is the light fixture I want. This is the light bulb that I want inside of it. Somebody has to make all those decisions along the way. And you're going to come out with a design development presentation then that you are going to share with your client. And you're going to get their approval. <laughs> you're going to have them sign off on it. And here's an example then of the refined furniture layout. So here it starts, yeah, you're smiling. It looks much better. You know, I love that loose schematic design, but this has a much more formal appeal to it. So you notice that the conference rooms, the meeting spaces, are pretty much around the perimeter of the building. All of the interior office spaces, here's an office, here's an office, 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 they're all on the inside. And then all of these, you know, people that unfortunately are working on these cubicles, if you will, they got sunlight. They're trying to make that corporate culture reflective in your plan of a company that values their employees. Albeit, they still have to make a profit. I mean, they still have to pay their employees. That's kind of a goal. And then this idea of community in this company, you will see focused here. This is a cafeteria and a lounge and a place where people can come and just work together as a team. And this has become the reception area. This is going to be a custom desk, place for people to come in and sit. And then this is uh, different conference rooms and the like along the way. Now, this is one way to show different areas, shared spaces, mail room by color. Personally, if I had this to do all over again, I think this needs some labels. I think to try to key this to down here is hard to figure out. It would be nice to know what department is actually planned to go here. And that there's a word here that says reception. And there's a word down here that says marketing or whatever it is. So keep that in mind that you may have worked with this 40 hours. You know, but your client doesn't. You haven't had that relationship with your client every day. So make sure that whatever you show to your client is well labeled. You're going to leave. You're going to leave this presentation with them. Maybe you only met with the executive board. And they're going to try to show it to their vice presidents or their directors, and they're going to forget. <laughs> and they're going to tell incorrect information. Um, so make sure what you leave with them is well labeled. How long, guys? What do you think we, how long are we spending in DD? How long? Give me a number. <laughs> that back row's being awful down quiet back there. <laughs> I think about 10 to 15. 10 to 15, okay. Anybody else? Let's go to the back row. Somebody over on this end. Tell me. What do you think? 20? Okay. Do I hear any more? Do I hear 30? <laughs> 30. Okay. This is pretty detailed. Because of the level of detail that happens at this phase, it's no longer this conceptual idea. As you have said, this is like, this is it. It might take 25 to 30% of your time, okay? 
Good. Move on. Okay. All right. Contract documentation. Now you're really into detail because no longer is it just pulling out that piece of fabric from the materials lab. You now have to write up, oh, that fabric is from Design Techs. And the name of that fabric is polka dots. And the colorway is green. And this is the number. And I want to have antimicrobial finish on it. And it needs to be installed on these chairs. Somebody has to write all that up so that somebody else can purchase it. Because you're not going to, as a design firm, purchase 300 chairs. Can you imagine the cost of that? The liability insurance you'd have to cover? But by golly, somebody else will take on that liability. They're called purchasing agents. And you have to tell them what to purchase. Okay? Now, from a construction standpoint, you've got to tell the contractor how to build this wonderful desk that you've designed. Looks like it's got a little drop front happening here. Obviously, it's got dual curves. It's got some type of something underneath here. Um, <clears throat> lots of fun details. Some people love detailing. You will find when you get into your classes where you're in detailing that there will be some students that will just run with it. They'll put, you know, they'll research all these different pieces and you'll put them together in little parts. Some people just love to do that. And some people, they have a hard time seeing it. And it really helps when you're working with Revit or other software that's showing you how these three-dimensional pieces are coming together to see details. Right down to, you know, what are these draperies or these uh, blinds going to look like behind this structural unit for a seismic control? You're thinking about all that. And I, I look at this place and I see a bunch of different movement going on. And it's, it's, I love the studio. Love the brick walls. Um, it's a really great place to work. but. You have to tell that contractor, how am I going to hang that drapery treatment so that I don't have glare? And how is it going to be hung there? I'm noticing, for instance, that it looks like the one on the left is, has a lot more to roll up than the one on the right. You see that? I huh, wonder what that's about. So, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and the, you know, I don't want to make it sound tedious, but it is important. And there's a lot of work to do. And frankly, as a young designer, this is what you get to do. Sorry. <laughs> um, so you're developing specs. You're developing your construction documents. You're specifying your furnishings. Um, and you're going to end up working a lot with allied designers, both at this phase and I should have mentioned the last phase, too. You're going to work with electrician electrical engineers, acoustical engineers, lighting engineers, a whole bunch of collaborations going on because you're having to look at HVAC. And for instance, the air is blowing out of this HVAC, well that may be an intake, right about here. Well, maybe this is a conference room and whoever is sitting here is going to get chilled or be overheated. So you may want to change the location of the heating vents based on your furniture. And so you'll have to work with the mechanical contractor to adapt that. Or maybe you have <laughs> a computer in the middle of the room. And you don't want your client to be stepping over the wires every time they try to make a presentation. So you're going to have to work with the electrical contractor to get a floor outlet right in the middle here. And why am I getting an incoming phone call from my father? I don't know because I didn't mute my phone. Sorry. <laughs> OK. So in this building, what do you think the floor is? 
underneath the carpet. Concrete? Concrete, yeah. It's an existing building. It cost a fortune to drill a line here to put the electrical outlet. You can see they've done it. Notice over here, you can't see back there, but there's an electrical outlet in the floor. Um, and that's where some of the power is coming from for this. In a residence, you're not going to have these wires laying all around. So you're really going to have to work up front before they pour the concrete basement to make sure you've got that electrical outlet where you need it to be. But if not, then yeah, you may have to pay to have the core floored because you certainly don't want cords draped around. Um, lighting, trying to decide what, how the lights are switched, which light switch turns on which light. You ever go into a room and you turn on the first light switch and it turns on some light over there behind the stairs? I'm staying at a B&B. &B. I walked in, I had four switches. Turned on the first one, nothing happened. Turned on the second one, nothing happened. Turned on the third one, nothing happened. Turned on the fourth one, still nothing happened. Okay, I'm like, how do you turn on the light switches? Well, they were all pre-programmed. Yeah, it's 10.30 at night, I'm coming in, I just flew in from Atlanta. This is not good. <laughs> you know, so have to use some logic. Those are things that you're doing during this contract document phase. Now, um, you end up uh, putting together, as I mentioned, this set of construction drawings. And if you are working with a residence, you probably have a contractor that you know that you'll hand your drawings off to, and they will literally build what it is you want done. But for a big firm, it may go out to what's called bidding, because they're trying to get the best price they can for this project. So you may have to oversee the bidding, or the company may have a facilities director that works with you to oversee the bidding. Um, but there'll be lots of questions that will come in from the contractors during that bidding phase. And sometimes you get, you have an additional fee for that. You can get, you can bill for that separately. Okay? So that's bidding. That kind of is an in-between phase at this point. <clears throat> okay, the last major phase is this idea of construction administration. This is the part of the job that Robert mentioned that you need to go out to the job site frequently and see what is going on. Not only to help yourself understand how things are built, but in order to make sure that everything is being built correctly. I've been on a job site where I kept looking at a wall going, it doesn't look right. Something's not right. And I pull up the plans and I look, and sure enough, they've put the wall in the wrong place. That happens a lot. It really does. And it's so much easier to catch before they put the electrical in or before they put some plumbing in the wall or before they tie the ceiling to the wall. And so if you can get out to the job site, I would recommend once a week. How often do you, have you found you going? Yeah. Um, depending on the size of the project, and just walk through and keep your eyes open. What are you seeing that's not working? Or God forbid, <laughs> you did put a wall in the wrong place. Now's the time to catch it and fix it. It'll be a lot cheaper than to do it after everything's been painted. Um, a lot of contractors these days, especially on large projects like floor plans like uh, Lynn has up there, will do what's called a wall check. And basically, they'll mark out on the concrete slab in chalk uh, where the walls are as they understand them to be from your drawings. And the wall check is an opportunity for you to go out there. And even though it's not a three-dimensional wall, you can check to make sure that they've understood your drawings and that those walls, are in, when they build them, are going to be in the right place. Yeah. And then they start putting in doors. Oh, they got the door swing backwards. I've had that happen a lot, too. You, you tell them to put the door this way, and then it swings the other way. And, you know, 
not to mention the fact that it's really fun to go to the job site because you, you start to see what you did on your plan and your elevations and your perspectives. You see that happen around you. It's like the most, one of the most rewarding things about design. And what's sad is as students, you don't get to experience that. You, know, you, you really don't get to see your projects come to fruition. Um, I, I wish there were a way around that, but there's, there's just not. Other than I have this hope that maybe by the time you've been in the field for five years, virtual reality will be the norm. Um, and right now, um, the, actually, your school, uh, Tom, do you guys know Tom Collin? Tom and Katie have been working with the industrial design department. And we've uncovered that this company called Unity which is a virtual reality company, is working with Autodesk and Revit so that hopefully down the road, those Revit files that you're creating or will create will turn into virtual reality. And you'll be able to put those goggles on and walk through the space you created. But more importantly, your client will. And that's what will be amazing. So I don't know if it'll be in my age, but certainly in y'all's, I'm from the South, okay. <laughs> Certainly in your time frame, I see that happening. It'll, you'll be able to walk through it. So you'll get to see your spaces even as students. Pretty neat. Okay, so you've, um, you know, everything's been installed, and then I thought I would show you then. Remember that initial drawing I had of the community space. This is actually the, how it ended up looking. And there are some changes. The ceiling changed some. We altered some of the fabric. The client didn't like the stripes, if you remembered. But that is one of the, the final spaces that actually uh, is in the interior. And then this was um, the reception area and how it ended up. Can't really see that reception desk over here, but that's one of those final uh, spaces. Okay. <clears throat> so what did we do three months from now? What do we go and do? Pardon me? Okay, the site plan was done. See, what did I do after it was after the whole thing was installed and everybody moved in? In about two months. Go back to your notes. Say it again. P O E. The P O E, and what does that stand for? Post-occupancy um, evaluation. Correct. Okay, we went back to see what worked and what didn't. Got to do that. Great learning curve. All right. I've taken up my hour easily. Questions? Because I'm going to give you a quiz. <laughs> yeah. So, um... On the last process of the whole, the, the last process? That post-occupancy evaluation yeah. or contract uh, administration? The, I guess, the, the very last stage where you said that the client didn't like the walls on that and they changed it or oh. is that what you said? <clears throat> During the schematic design and design development presentation, uh -huh. the client didn't like the striped fabric. Gotcha. So before we went into contract documentation, we changed and got rid of the striped fabric. Oh, okay, so it wasn't like the... No. Oh, okay. Thankfully, gotcha. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thankfully there's a good enough relationship with the client that they said, yeah, I don't like that stripe. Okay, that was a minor thing, so that's true. And also to realize that <clears throat> What you show your client in design development, to some extent, is still an artistic drawing. Um, and things are going to change along the way. I've never had a client like hold me to something that close. <clears throat> Pretty similar here, but you see the stripe? Just didn't work. They didn't, I didn't like it either, but no. <clears throat> kind of gives you the same feel for how it, it was similar. Still some changes. <clears throat>